to Genesis uh, chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. Well, when Joseph had interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, then everyone, of course, saw them. They, they saw the truth of them. They were grasped by it. And they knew that what Joseph had said was indeed the reason why God had given this revelation to Pharaoh. There would now be seven years of great plenty, perfect climatic conditions for bumper harvests. There would be rain at the right time, not too much, winds that were not too strong and scorching, one year of mammoth harvest, another year, another year of bounty, another year when new barns had to be built and so on, for seven full years. No starvation at all. In the Middle East, all would have a redundance. And this, you remember, taking place in a world under the curse. As God had announced to rebellious Adam and Eve, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it. All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For there dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Now for these next seven years, it's almost as if the curse of God on creation was rolled back. And Joseph and his Jehovahist family back in Canaan could speak plainly to their family, to their close servants, and witness to them, our God is doing this. It is God who gives us all things richly to enjoy, and that's our testimony in the affluent society that we live in. Just as Paul told the philosophers of Athens that it was his God, the Creator, who gives all men life and breath and everything else. If you've had a, a richly blessed life, then the author of every blessing that you have enjoyed is our creator God, the living God. Not luck, not chance, but this good God and how long-suffering and how patient he has been with you. Now, during those seven plentiful years, the people still worshipped the Nile. And they worshipped the sun god. And they worshipped crocodiles. And they worshipped sacred cats. They exposed their babies that were unwanted overnight to die. They hung their uppity servants so that vultures would peck their eyes out. That's how it was. God bless them with such material plenty. The Egyptians during this time went through a regime of gathering up a percentage of the corn. Commissioners were appointed over the land. A fifth of the corn that was grown in Egypt was taken from the people during the years of abundance. And they gathered large quantities of the food during these good years under the authority of Pharaoh, and they kept it stored in cities where it would be easier than to guard until the time it needed to be used when the seven years of barrenness began. Now I want to firstly speak to you about the coming of the seven years of famine. The reason for the 20% deduction of their grain had to be explained to the people. Seven whole years of plenty are ours now, but they'll come to an end. Then 
This will happen. There will be seven years. Seven years of famine. And if people challenged that prediction and thought from now on there would be a, a brave new world. And challenged the fact that a fifth of their harvests were being taken from them. Then they were told, no, there is a new man who is leading the country under the authority of Pharaoh. He's a Hebrew, and his name is Zaphonath Paneah. And Pharaoh has given him the hand of Asenath, the, the daughter of Potiphera, the, the priest of On, in marriage. And it's his God. It's the God of the Hebrews, is the man who perforated the dreams, the sleep of Pharaoh, and told him that this would happen. And do you know that this man, every dream he interprets is true? It was an extraordinary testimony to all of Egypt of the truth and the power of the living God. Years of abundance would change the way of life for these people. For seven years it would bring extraordinary prosperity to the whole nation. One year of bounty following another. Wave upon wave of blessing. And all of it the gift of the God that uh, Joseph worshipped. He was now the most powerful man in the world alongside Pharaoh. And you might think that all this would draw many people to put their faith in Joseph's God. Or the long years of famine that followed would also have the same impact. It would turn people away from materialism and it would make them cast themselves on Jehovah, the great I Am, the God of history, the God of the future, the God who ruled the climate you might imagine that there would be a large-scale turning to God for naturalistic reasons like the ones I've suggested to you. But we have no evidence at all that anything like this happened. Prosperity can make people contented without God. Famine can make people bitter against God. What we do know is that Joseph survived at the top. He survived there and... Uh, unchallenged in his authority, unbought by the gratitude of those that had done well, the landowners, the, the farmers, they couldn't bribe him, and unintimidated by the anger of those who starved during the seven difficult years. Those years of want, when God dealt with the rebellious mankind, as we men and women deserve, were not confined to Egypt. There was distress throughout the Middle East. And once again, Egypt was the breadbasket of the whole region. Verse 5, famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now what should the line of Abram do? Well, they were a hopeless group. When the brothers got together and had a family discussion about the crisis that they were facing, all they did was to keep glancing at one another. Verse 1, they were paralyzed. They were brothers without leadership, without motivation. They were brothers in despair. What a bunch they were. Simeon and Levi had tripped and brutally slaughtered all the men of Shechem and had enslaved their women and children. Reuben, the oldest son, had committed incest with his father's own concubine, the, the mother of a number of his half-brothers. And Judah had a child by his daughter-in-law. People today would dub them a family from hell. And yet, can you believe that in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, that when the holy city comes down out of heaven from God, it is the names of these brothers that mark the twelve gates of the heavenly city. What happened? What did God do to change these bestial, ignorant men? If there is hope for them, then there is hope for every single person in this gathering tonight. So on this occasion we are told that it was their father 
Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, who took the lead and galvanized them into action and told them what they must do. He had heard that there was food in Egypt, so he exhorted his sons, go south and buy grain. Ten of them were to go together because there was safety in numbers and they could bring back far more in their, on their caravan of donkeys. But he would keep Benjamin, Joseph's only full brother. Moses explains to us the reason that Jacob was afraid that harm or accident might befall him. It's a, it's a vague term in the original, the commentators told me. The old man was afraid what had happened to Joseph might well happen to Benjamin. He still had some prior affection for the daughters, for the, for the sons that he had born with uh, Rachel. He seems to have had some suspicion of the other brothers. But this time they gave no negative reaction. There was no response to his decision to keep Benjamin at home. They had enough guilt of what they had done last time. And so um, the boys went off to Egypt. We know something of what God was doing. And it was far more than making sure that this one family survived. He was drawing his brothers into contact with Joseph once again. He was setting up the whole machinery of reconciliation. He was going to protect the line of Abraham, the promised seed to be born, the line of Joseph's brother, Judah, because Judah's great-great-great-great-great-grandson would be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, coming in the world in the fullness of time. And Almighty God was determined to protect that line during famine years. How would God bring blessing to all the nations of the world as he promised Abram he would? It would be through the coming of the promised Messiah. And the Messiah would come Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and his line. God will take this determination as far as is needed. God had been prepared to send Joseph into exile. To put him in Potiphar's household. To put him in prison against his will. Twenty years of slavery and imprisonment. And then all the temptations of Pharaoh's court. God was now prepared to create an international famine crisis. Seven years of drought, children crying, beasts dying by the thousand in the fields. He would go that far to ensure that Jesus the Christ, the son of Judah, would come. More than that, he was prepared for his own son to be the seed of Abraham, to become incarnate, to live in the darkness where cruelty and hatred abounded, to himself be born in a stable and live in obscurity and his ministry face hateful opposition and be whipped and crucified and killed and buried in a cold tomb, the one and only true and living God was prepared to do that in order that all the nations of the earth, distant Wales, in 2,000 years' time, would be blessed. So how important is the coming of the seed of Abram? Well, it's cosmically crucial. It's of life and death significance. It is eternally important for your never-dying souls. There is redemption from the curse that's lying on the cosmos only through the promised seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. Only by his safe coming into the world. There cannot be redemption in any other. Only in him and him alone can the world be decursed and regenerated. Second thing I want you to see here is the coming of the ten brothers to Egypt. 
At last, the dreams of Joseph are fulfilled. They arrive with other non-Egyptians to purchase grain. But unknowingly, they are encountering their long-lost brother. Now, God's wrath against the brothers for their wickedness to Joseph, their brother, and Jacob, their father, begins to be revealed. And one blessed response to that is going to be their repentance. You see, first of all, this God's earlier revelation to Joseph in both the dreams he had was fulfilled. After Joseph had been sold into slavery, barely spared from death in the pit, if we didn't know how his story ended, we'd have wondered, how in the world are these dreams going to be fulfilled? How in the world is... Are his brothers going to bow? His father bow before him? That will never come true. But but God has said it. God has prophesied this is going to happen. It's going to happen. The Lord has said you can trust God. And remember, the second dream was not now about ugly, scrawny cows eating the fat, sleek cows that came out of the Nile. But it's to do with a stalk of grain bowing down to Joseph. And here we see then the the connection which Joseph would never have imagined if he'd been told 20 years earlier that one day he was going to have authority and sovereignty over his family. He didn't have a clue how he would be the one ordained of God to spare their lives from famine. Now it's clearer the significance of the full head of grain. Ah, he can understand it. We see it here in this passage where all his uh, ten brothers with their empty sacks needing grain for their survival and their wives and their children and Joseph, the only one in the world who was able to provide it for them. Secondly, we're told that Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him, verses 7 and 8. His brothers came to him and they bowed down to him, their faces to the ground, just as the dream said would happen. And he knew them straight away. We're told that he pretended he was a stranger, that he'd never seen them before. They certainly didn't recognize him. You see the word recognize is emphasized there. It's in verse 7 and it's then in in verse 8. It's the same word that um, the brothers used when they brought the coat of many colors dipped in blood and gave it to their father and says, do you recognize this coat? It's the same word that uh, Tamar used when uh, she was accused of being a prostitute and she asked Judah, the father of her child-to-be, if he recognized the pledges that he had left for her uh, in return for sexual favors that he'd received. Recognition, the term of recognition, it's, it's very important in this, in this story because a person who recognizes, a person who has knowledge of truth, that man has power. That man has knowledge. He can think aright, he can cope aright with whatever providence brings into his life, because he has knowledge, he has recognition. The brothers had last seen young Joseph when he was about 17 years of age. You know, uh, over 20 years earlier, when he was a gangling teenager. Now he's in his late 30s. He has an Egyptian name. He has Egyptian clothes. He's probably clean-shaven. Um, probably all the hair on his head has been shaved off. Uh, while the Hebrews standing in front of him were all hirsute. What a scene lies before us of all the brothers kissing the dirt at Joseph's feet, quite ignorant. This is their younger brother who once they planned to kill. We're not told what Joseph's state of mind was when he first saw his brothers. All we know is that the last time that Joseph was speaking... He was thanking God and he was grateful that he had forgotten his household. 
chapter 41 and verse 51. That's the last time that uh, Joseph is talking about his family. He was blessing God that the memory of all the awfulness that he had suffered at their hand, uh, the, the contempt and scorn for him that had gone on for months, finally the hatred that hadn't responded when he'd cried from the cistern into which they'd thrown him, don't leave me here, spare me. He can thank God now that those things would just gnawed away at him for years. Now had gone, it, it didn't bother him any longer. Here's the big picture. No matter what you think Joseph is feeling, we do know that when he, at, at this time, he thought again of the dreams that he'd had as a teenager. Twenty years had passed. And they were significant dreams, but they'd faded something insignificant, surely, um, over twenty years. And now, the dreams came back to him so vividly and he thought my God is so faithful he met with me he, he spoke to me at that time and God is pursuing a course of action which is going to fulfill what he said to me when I was a teenage boy and he's gripped by the memory of those dreams and he sees all his family now all ten brothers, they are there, faces to the ground before him. And the dreams just leap up. The revelation from God is so striking to him. And now he starts to think, I'm going to bring all the brothers. I'm going to bring all the family here to Egypt. He's not satisfied with just ten boys alone. Where's his father? Where's his other father? Full brother, where is dear little Benjamin? He doesn't want to exult over them. But because God has kept his word in the great events of history, he's kept his word to Pharaoh, and there's a worldwide famine. And in the smallest events, a dream he had as a boy, and the night he woke up and he couldn't forget those two dreams. Well, here, here is a God who is in charge of the great and he's in charge of the little and he's in charge of my life. God's plan must come to fruition. So some can say that Joseph was being vindictive and petty and vengeful. But his, his dealings with his brother and what he insisted upon and all the complications of what he required from them, it was all motivated by the fact that there could be forgiveness and there could be reconciliation. So Joseph set out on this course of action which was going to result in these wayward, ignorant, carnal boys facing up to their sin and finding forgiveness. What, what will God do to make you repent? What will God do what lengths will God go to to give me a repentant heart? How will he use this congregation and this mysterious influence we have over one another, the words we say, the prayers we hear one another pray? What will God do to bring you to repentance for your sins and faith in Jesus Christ? Will he use my accusations, my searching words. I'm often saying to you, can you be a Christian and behave as you behave? Can you be a true disciple while you still believe these errors? When you are doctrinally not as wise and mature as your years of attendance under gospel preaching should have made you. Are you taking the members of Christ and joining them to a harlot? Do ten brothers murder another brother? Do they sell him into slavery? Does a Christian behave? Does a Christian live like that? 
In other words, I'm searching you. I'm probing you. I'm making accusations. They may be true, they may not, in the light of Scripture. I am describing what the Bible says, how Christians live, and what Christians believe. And I am constantly measuring your life by these standards. They are God-given standards. The only people who can say they are Christians are those who say, yes, I believe what the Bible says about what the Gospel is, and I try to live as the Bible says a Christian should live. There's no deliverance. There's no true repentance without that. There's no hope for you without that. You are self-deceived without that. Thirdly, I want you to see how Joseph make, made these accusations of his brothers. He begins by testing them concerning their really being spies. Now, what would be the source of that accusation? Well, apparently is this. It's this. Ten brothers. Ten. I don't think I've ever met ten brothers. Ten who claim to be brothers and all come from another land and they've come to Egypt. Ten. For grain, isn't that suspicious? Would any father send ten of his sons? It's almost his entire legacy. I'm asking, this is what Pharaoh, uh, Joseph was asking them, would, uh, would any father from another country send ten of his sons, most of his boys, on a long journey at a dangerous time of international crisis, to gain food? Three could do it. So Joseph has a little credence then to put on this pose of suspicion. Look at them and challenge them, his eyes flashing and his finger wagging at them. He knows they're brothers. They know he knows that they are his brothers. He says, why should I believe? that you are ten brothers. You are spies. You come from the borderlands to find out where our defenses are weakest. Verse 12. No, no, they say. No, no. We are honest men. We are brothers. Uh, we are the sons of one father. We are not spies. Verse 11. And so in order to, uh, to clarify and, and substantiate their truth, they say quite accurately, well, wait a minute, um, actually we're twelve brothers. One of them is back with our dad. Another of them is dead. And they begin to give more information about their family background now to establish the, the credibility of their story. That's what they're doing. And then this gives Joseph his opportunity in verses 14 to 17. It's just as I told you. You're spies. And this is how you'll be tested as surely as Pharaoh lives. You will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your members to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you're telling the truth. If you're not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you're spies. And he put them all in the clink for three days. Over and over again, the test is on the truthfulness of the words of this lying bunch of scoundrels. <laughs> These are the boys who once stood in solidarity before their father and, and handed a, a coat of many colors. The money for having sold the boy who once wore that coat in their pockets. And they said, you recognize the coat? And of course they all did. They broke his heart. And they didn't tell him they'd sold their brother, their brother into slavery in Egypt. Joseph is testing them. He's testing their honesty. He is underlining the importance of their of truthfulness. It's convicting of their sin. It's accelerating the process of repentance. 
And he puts them in prison for three days just for them to have a taste of incarceration in all its uh, horror, an Egyptian jail. Now, he's not being vindictive. There's actually a lot of generosity on Joseph's part. It's just three days. He was almost three years in prison. And if he want, he's wanting to get even, well, that's not the way to do it. And then he tells them at first, one of you can return. The rest of you stay in prison until he gets back. Verse uh, 16. Think of that, one of them, going off on the hazardous journey back to Jacob by himself. Facing all the dangers by himself. Not having the bunch of these uh, scallywags with him. Um, with their skill in swords and slings. And that fear sinks in, uh, but he thinks more about it. He revises his plans, and then he says, verse 19, well, all of you except one can go back. You must bring your youngest brother to me. And then his kindness, the other side of Joseph's wonderful personality, shows itself. And he supplies them freely with food for the journey home as well as grain that they can take back to their, uh, their families. He's concerned that their hearts change. What good, though, is their physical coming together? What good would it be for him to say, I'm your brother? Well, they are still in a ignorant and defiant and unrepentant and unregenerate frame of mind. That's no good. There has to be the grace of repentance and godly sorrow in their hearts. He's not very interested in re-engaging the relationship without contrition. He wants their sorrow to be commensurate with the uh, the wretchedness of what they did to a brother and a father. And then fourthly, we see here how Joseph's plan begins to accomplish a new spirit in their brothers. Uh, he, he achieves conviction of their hearts and the beginning of new repentance. It took all this to do it. Uh, you remember, they had heard when they had thrown him into the, when they'd thrown Joseph into the cistern, and they slaughtered an animal and they made a meal for themselves, uh, they'd finally had revenge on this uh, obstreperous young man, this young brother of theirs, and they threw him into a cistern. They could hear him shouting, "Save me! Deliver me! Don't leave me here to die!" They just ate their food together, and then the uh, Ishmaelite Midianites. The slave traders came round the bend and they found another way of making money out of him. His cries hadn't touched their hearts. His father's spirit of mourning that went on for days and weeks and years at the death of his beloved Joseph, that, that hadn't changed their hearts at all. God had waited 20 years and there was still no repentance. And so God picked up a rod, finally, with as much reluctance as any father here would pick up a rod. And the rod was Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, and the power he had. And God brought Joseph's words down upon these brothers sharply. Because there's one message that he needs to bring home. No repentance. No salvation. No repentance. No heaven. And the message starts to hit home. Verse uh, 21. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. We wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, 
Did I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen? No, we must give an accounting for his blood. They hadn't forgotten, had they? The events of that, that day. Twenty years had gone by, but it was a day as vivid to them. His appearing, his coming, their hatred, their planning to kill him. They're throwing him into the pit. Uh, one brother uh, asking for mercy and then going off. And when he came back, the traitors had come and taken him away. The monstrous wickedness, the killing of the lamb, the dabbing of the coat of many colors into the, into the blood and then presenting it when they walked all the way back for some days to their father. Monstrous wickedness. This man is speaking to them with irresistible authority. He puts them in jail. He leaves one brother there in jail. He has absolute authority to do that and they're helpless. He demands that they return with Benjamin. And then he, uh, their response to that is God is judging us. God is dealing with us because of our sin. And they, they break ranks and one says, well, it, I told you not to do it. Are we continuing in a sinful course of action? Do we find ourselves when we get on our knees and we start to pray that God says, what about this? And you can't pray because God says, but what about this? You can't thank him, you can't intercede for anything, God says. But this is going on. And one of the fruits of Joseph's intervention is that for the first time in their lives, his brothers are talking openly. Something they wouldn't talk about. They wouldn't mention it. It was past. It was finished. But their consciences were always convicted them about it. There is no peace for the wicked. They mentioned the distress of Joseph's soul crying to them from the pit when they were having that meal together. They admit now what once they had done to their brother. The distress they'd caused. They can see, ah, God's remembered it. God saw it. God's hand is on us still. It's heavy on us. So in an overwhelming way, their sin hit home. God can do this. They saw with hard conviction what they'd done. They acknowledged that they were getting their just desserts. Even Joseph was weeping as he heard their words and saw the change in them, and he had to hide his tears from them. Of course, they'd all been talking to him through an interpreter. He could understand every word uh, that they said, but he never let on. And so the interpreter is saying what the boys have said in Egyptian, but he can hear and he can understand it all, and their grumbles and their grief and their guilt. He can see, he can hear it all. God was there in the encounter. God was beginning to do an extraordinary work, convicting of sin, reconciling estranged men, a work that Joseph himself could never have anticipated, and certainly his brothers could never have anticipated. What we're experiencing here is an unusual providence and then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is God teaching us? What's he teaching me? What's the purpose in Scripture of this passage for me and my life tonight? When we hear sermons uh, on providence, we, we have to ask ourselves, what is God teaching me? My point is that we often look at a providence and we ask, well, what is God teaching others through this providence? But I say when we look at providence and dark providences in particular, it is appropriate to ask, 
Why are you reminding me of these things? Lord, is it I? Is it I? And then thirdly and lastly here, we see the coming home to Jacob. And that firstly they told their father the truth. The whole truth and and nothing but the truth. Uh, Why do I make a song and dance of, of it like that? Well, because the last time these ten brothers returned from a long journey away. From a strange land, from the land of Dothan. They told him the most cruel lies. They told him that wild animals had killed his beloved son. They produced the coat. Now as painful as it is when they come into his presence now, they have to tell him the truth. Pure and simple. There's no alternative. Another son, again, is missing, this time Simeon. And in order to get him back alive, they have to take Benjamin down to Egypt. Maybe um, in our lifetimes, the whole truth about what we are and how we've lived, maybe that'll never be known. And maybe it's a good thing. You don't know all the truth about me and I don't know all the truth about you. God knows. There's nothing secret to him. We must all appear before him. Our lives must be evaluated by him. That's the nature of the universe that he has made. And us, in his image and in his likeness, he has set eternity in our hearts. You can't kill and betray and rape and steal and lie and abuse and there not be a reckoning. God knows the man who took the little girl, Madeleine, from her bed in that Portuguese hotel and what has happened to her God knows he will call that man to account he will call this man to account he will call all of us to account so let's speak the truth and they come back and this time instead of telling him barefaced cruel lies they tell him The truth as it is. And the second thing I want you to see as we close is that uh, it's not easy to read providences. Jacob looked at these boys. And he must have ruled the day he begat the lot of them. He says to them, you have deprived me of my children, verse 36. You've deprived me. You've done it. You've deprived me. Of uh, my children, Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Now we know Joseph was alive, and he was working hard and wisely that they all might be reconciled as a family, and that the line of Judah may be preserved, and Christ will come. Simeon was being well looked after in the luxury suite of the, of the Egyptian prison. And they would see him again and Benjamin would live to old age. Everything, in fact, was working together for the good of Jacob. But he couldn't see it. I'm saying to you that it is not easy to interpret providences. You ask, why is God dealing with me in this way, Pastor? Why has he brought this trouble into my life? Uh, You wrote off your car in a freak accident. You're ill and you need uh, an operation and you're waiting for it. Your boyfriend writes you a Dear Mary letter and ends the relationship. There's trouble in the congregation. Now what is God saying through providences like this? And I don't think I can help you. I don't think I can give you uh, the precise meaning of these things. I'm saying to you, it's, it's tricky to interpret providences. I'm saying, go to God. 
spread it all out before God and say, now, I don't know why this has happened to me, Lord, but you know, tell God about it. Um, You have to say to God, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. You say that to God. You're honest, you're open with the Lord. And if there are lessons that he is to teach you, please teach me your lessons. Make me a good disciple through the troubles that I'm going through. You have to say that to God. You can see how difficult it is. How difficult it was for this whole family to understand what was going on. They they just had a little bit of information. They had no idea that this powerful figure in Egypt was actually Jacob's son and their brother. They didn't know that God was in him and God was in all this circumstance working away. It's uh, very clear early on that Moses believes that the the brothers of Joseph were right to think that God was visiting his punishment upon them. That was absolutely true, verse 21. Um, God was punishing them and, and Moses sees that. The rod of chastening was on their back, and justifiably so. But in another place in this chapter, well, it seems they're getting paranoid. They're, 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 they're totally confused. They open the bags in their father's home, and they find all the money there. The money to buy grain. Joseph, in his kindness, has given them back. The price, the whole price, all the silver that they took down, they find it's been brought back. Uh, Joseph had no intention of uh, taking from his brother's money to fatten his own, uh, his own bank account. He had millions in the bank. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world. He, he didn't want to take advantage of them for their survival. The heart of Joseph... Uh, He would bless them. He would prosper them. So he put their money in their bags. He gave his servant instruction to put the money in their bags. But the servant made a mistake. And in one of the bags, which was to be used for feeding the the donkeys and themselves on their journey home, he put one of the bags. So when the servant then, on one of the first nights away from Egypt, when he went to open the bag and get the grain to give to the donkeys, he found There was the leather bag with all his silver in it. And when they got home, they opened the other bags, they found all their money. Did they understand God's providence? Did they say, he wasn't a bad old stick, that Egyptian. He was a kind man behind that gruff exterior. Uh, There was a good heart beating. Did they respond like that? No, they were scared stiff. They interpreted the providence of kindness with fear. Verse 35. It was a flashing warning of danger. The Egyptian had set them up. That's what it, it was a setup. When they go back, he'd arrest a lot of them. And he said, you never paid me. You stole the grain and you never paid me a thing for it. And he would convict them. Not now of being spies, but of being thieves. And when Jacob saw it, verse 35, Jacob was frightened too. He read that providence of Joseph's generosity as uh, another evidence that God was against him. I'm saying to you, interpreting providence, oh, it's so difficult. What is God doing now with these difficulties and with these troubles that I face? Oh, I'm so glad he knows what he's doing. He hasn't revealed the reason to me, but he's in charge. He is in control. Some things we get right. When providence has come, immediately we think of chastening for our sins, don't we? We think of our failures. Uh, That's the automatic response. And that's all right. But you mustn't absolutize that as the only reason. When um, 
when Paul had the thorn in the flesh, then it was to prepare him for greater usefulness in the years to come, wasn't it? To make him holier and more wise and sweeter and enable him to write the letters that are our meat and drink in the church 2,000 years later God uses a thorn in the flesh for those reasons it wasn't a punishment for certain awful sins that Paul had done in the past so please be careful in interpreting providence lastly let me say this don't say wild things when, uh, when difficult providences come into your life. Remember Dr. Lloyd-Jones' counsel. Never take big decisions when you're feeling ill. And uh, you can all see the wisdom of that because when you're ill and when you're under pressure, then you're likely not to have a clear mind to make a wise decision. And I'm saying to you, when strange pressures come to bear upon you, be careful with your tongues, with your words, what you talk to other people on the phone, what you say to them, what you listen from other people. I'm thinking of foolish Reuben here. All right, Reuben, the man who committed incest with his father's concubine. And now Reuben speaks up, verse 37. You may put both of my sons to death if I don't bring him back to you, entrust Benjamin to my care and I will bring him back. Well, you know, his heart has changed. There's no doubt of that. He'd broken his father's heart on more than one occasion. And he doesn't want that to happen again. He's changing. He wants to protect Benjamin. He wants to protect Benjamin's life and to bring him back. To his father. But what an oath. What a desperately wicked oath he makes. How utterly stupid and cruel. As if the possible loss of the second of Jacob's sons by Rachel. That that could somehow be compensated for by killing the two sons of Reuben. Aren't they the grandsons? Of Jacob? He is just a, a big country yokel. Isn't he, Reuben? He had no skill to advise. No skill to counsel the family in its deep dilemmas. You needed a, you needed a scalpel to separate soul and spirit and bone and marrow in this providence. And what you've got is a a meat cleaver <laughs> in these words of Reuben. And this chapter ends then where we often find ourselves temporarily in uh, Christian deadlock. And that's all right. That we go away thinking of that, that possibility. I'm saying God can bring us to a situation where we are at loggerheads. A husband against a wife and a wife against a husband. Christians. Where a brother and another brother oppose one another. Where the elders of a congregation are not in agreement. What is God's will? Where do we go from here? And the boys, the ten boys are really of one mind. They're nine boys now, of course, because the tenth is, Simeon is back in Egypt. They want to say, let's go. Please let us take Benjamin with us. We'll guard him with our lives. We can present him quickly to Joseph. We can say, here he is. This is the, this is the boy that's missing now. Give us Simeon. And then we'll beetle back home as fast as we can. My father isn't at all in agreement with that. Verse 38. My son will not go down there with you. Okay, words of one syllable. My son will not go down there with you. Get it straight. Read my lips. His brother is dead. And he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking... 
you'll bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. And with that Jehovahist impasse, the chapter ends. And so often we find ourselves in an impasse of disagreement. But God is going to resolve it. Lord, we pray that uh, this passage of the Bible again will show to us how important it is that we come to repentance for our sins. That we don't treasure up something for 20 years and refuse to confess our wickedness and sorrow before an old man that we've hurt. Deliver us from that. I pray, O Lord, when we don't understand why providences have been as they have been in our lives, why prayers have been unanswered, and we, we are we're troubled. Help us when the answer doesn't come quickly to trust Thee. We confess to Thee we don't deserve everything to be smooth in our lives because there's far too much sin and pride in us. But, oh, have mercy on us, we pray. And when we reach an impasse, a husband and a wife and parents and children and brothers, members of a congregation and elders, we see it here. And, oh, we pray as thou will resolve it for Jacob and his boys. Resolve it for us, please. Oh, Lord, guide us all. Work all these things for our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.